my wife and I, we get a lot of stuff delivered to the house rather than going out uh, ourselves. And I always encourage people to kind of look into uh, deliveries that they can get to their home rather than having to go out to a physical location. Uh, and just another reminder, if everyone can mute their microphones uh, as we get into the lecture, uh, it's always nice to hear everyone's voice, but it can be a little distracting. Uh, I wanted to talk about the Art Institute of Chicago uh, for a few different reasons. Uh, one of them is because I actually went to the Art Institute of Chicago. So for me, it's a little bit of a, of a trip back home. Uh, the, the Art Institute of Chicago is kind of an interesting place because it's outside of New York. And <laughs> for a lot of people, it's hard to imagine that there's a, a huge amount of art outside of New York City, but the Art Institute of Chicago is the second largest uh, museum in the United States. And uh, for me, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice place uh, with a kind of a specific focus. They, they have a broader idea of art, but uh, this was mentioned by some of the, the folks before the lecture. If you're a fan of French Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, uh, to my knowledge, the Art Institute of Chicago has one of the larger collections uh, outside of Paris. Uh, and we'll, we'll see why here when, I uh, when we go through the lecture, but if this is your type of art and you haven't been to the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, again, it, it has just a wealth of, of that area of art in addition to many other uh, areas of art. Uh, and you'll see this, of course, as we get through. Uh, we're starting the lecture with a very famous lion. There's, there's actually two of these flanking uh, the entrance to the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, but these are kind of like our soap spuds uh, uh, for, you know, Will Rogers. And you can see uh, what they do in Chicago is whenever there's a big event or what have you, uh, they of course <laughs> dress up the lions. Uh, this was during when the Cubs won the World Series. Uh, and you can see he, of course, has a Cubs hat on, uh, which begs the question, I always wonder if these are in fact lions uh, or if perhaps they're a different animal uh, in disguise. They could very well be bears uh, as well. Uh, but again, kind of the local flair of Chicago uh, and incorporating the, these wonderful statues in as well. Uh, recently, this is actually what they look like, which I think is absolutely adorable. Uh, I'm sure that some of us have seen this around with different uh, statues, but they did do these to the lions as well. Uh, the really kind of funny part, I think, uh, is that somebody stole one of the lion's masks, and, and I'm not sure if they decided uh, that it would be a good souvenir or if they were just like an incredibly large person uh, who was concerned for their personal safety, but uh, it was actually replaced. And if you know the Chicago sculptural scene, you of course know that there's a very famous Pablo Picasso sculpture in uh, Chicago and they were good enough uh, to protect that as well. Uh, the real, you know, the, the cubist joke that you can make with this is that they actually covered up its eyes instead of its nose uh, and that its nose is on its forehead, but you know, cubist jokes, what can you do? So anyway, let's move forward here uh, and let's talk about the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, this is an older diagram or drawing of, of where the official structure actually lied. Uh, and you can see uh, it's actually changed a remarkable amount from this time. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about the Art Institute of Chicago uh, isn't just because I went there, but it's different than the other museums that we've looked at in, in that the Art Institute of Chicago is a school of art. Uh, and we have various academies of art throughout the United States, but in my mind, the Art Institute of Chicago uh, is really kind of the, the, the larger of the group. And again, uh, this is a function of a museum that we haven't really talked about, and that is that as an, as an instructional institution. Uh, as I mentioned, I went to the Chicago Institute of Art, and it's actually kind of located behind uh, the museum itself, but uh, again, it was a, the museum itself was a big part of the education. Uh, you were, uh, as a student, you were free to go to the museum whenever you wanted to. Uh, and, and that was actually kind of nice because it's uh, a little bit more expensive. And as an art student, you of course couldn't afford it. So it actually started in 1866 as the Chicago Academy of Design. And it was founded by 35 local artists. 
1867, their Academy of Arts stature was formally accepted. And by 1868, classes, classes were taught every single day. Uh, you would have to pay a whopping fee of $10 a month uh, in order to attend classes. Uh, and in 1870, the school, because of the amount of people that were influxing into the school and its popularity, actually moved to West Adams Street and into a five-story building. Uh, what happens next is, of course, pretty famous. In 1871, we have the Great Fire of Chicago, uh, and it completely destroyed the Art Institute. Uh, by 1878, the Academy of Design uh, was actually $10,000 in debt, which doesn't sound like a huge amount for today, uh, but in 1878 dollars, that's quite substantial. So what they actually did, uh, I thought this was a rather clever way to do this, uh, they essentially declared bankruptcy and abandoned uh, the Chicago Academy of Design. Uh, and then within the same year, they developed the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, a different group than the Chicago Academy of Design. And then they went back and bought a lot of the things from the Chicago Academy of Design at big discount rates because they were, of course, in bankruptcy. Uh, moving forward from there in 1882, it's officially called the Art Institute of Chicago. And the first president is Charles A. Hutchinson, who did a tremendous amount uh, to foster the building and also uh, the art school. Uh, he really is kind of quintessential in the turning of this into a major institution. Uh, they buy the first plot uh, at the corner of Michigan and Van Buren. And in 1887, a museum actually opens. But uh, by 1890, in 1892 and 1893, we of course have the very famous World's Columbian Exhibition there in Chicago. Uh, and what they did was they worked it out with the city where they each paid half uh, and they essentially made what we think of as uh, the Art Institute of today. And if you look at this diagram, one of the things you'll notice is there used to actually be uh, a, a set of railroads that actually went behind the Art Institute. Uh, as the Art Institute has expanded, uh, it has expanded over those railroad tracks and th that railroad is no longer functional uh, behind the museum. This is a postcard of what the museum actually looked like in 1907. Uh, and it's another one of these older photographs that's kind of weird because you just don't see anything else around it. Uh, it's, it's just this building by itself. Uh, but you can of course see the famous lion there out front. Uh, if you look very, very closely, it's a quintessential part of the structure. Interestingly, uh, I mentioned that they had the, the Columbian exhibition uh, in Chicago and the first function of the Art Institute of Chicago was actually to hold the world's parliament of religions. Uh, and I found this wonderful old photograph of the world parliaments of religions and, and you can see this, all of this variety of different nationalities and ethnicities uh, on the stage, and this was actually a very large deal uh, for, for the period where, again, uh, it was one of the first times you have this conglomeration of different religions meeting together uh, in form of a discussion. Uh, my, one of my favorite things is this row of hats that you have up on the stage uh, from the gentleman in the front, where, where else are you going to put your hat? Uh, just put it in front of you, of course. We then move forward and by 1913, we have the famous Armory Show uh, that happens in New York City. And this was of course a traveling exhibition. Uh, the image that I'm showing you is what the Armory Show looked like when it actually went to Chicago and was shown at the Art Institute of Chicago. You'll notice kind of this peculiar way uh, that they're hanging the paintings very low to the ground and they're really just kind of stacking the paintings on top of each other. Uh, what you're actually looking at is the cubist room uh, and believe it or not there were several complaints about the art in the cubist room uh, and it actually caused a little bit of a controversy within Chicago uh, to have these outlandish paintings on exhibition. Uh, moving forward from uh, in, in 1924 to 1925, we have a major contribution of 52 Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings to the Art Institute. And, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture that uh, the Art Institute really has 
a, a tremendous amount of impressionist work, and that's really where it originates from. Uh, an interesting to kind of thing to kind of think about, though, uh, is that this work was given to the Art Institute in 1924 to 25. Uh, most of this work was created between 1870 to 1880. So in reality, a lot of the work uh, that was given is only about 40 years old. Uh, and when you think about that in proximity to the contemporary period, uh, that would be as if in the now you had a painting uh, that was only created in like 1980 or so. So the time period between when this stuff was given to the Art Institute of Chicago and when it was actually created uh, is not that much in terms of art history. Uh, we then have a major contribution by Martin A. Ryerson, who gives a tremendous amount of art, uh, especially art outside of the Western tradition, uh, as they say, uh, and we'll look at that very, very briefly. By 1933 and the World's Fair, they had accumulated enough art that they actually had an exhibition called The Century of Progress, uh, and as you can read from my notes, there was 1.5 million visitors to that exhibition, one of the largest exhibitions, uh, again, in the United States. In 2009, they in opened up a, a modern wing to the museum because they had collected so much art. Uh, this greatly expanded the size of the museum by about 30% or so, and it now makes the Art Institute of Chicago the second largest museum within the United States. Uh, in, in 2015, we also have a major uh, uh, collection of pop art, Andy Warhol, Lichtenstein, those type of folks given to the Art Institute. And in 2018, uh, th they actually received uh, a donation of $50 million to the Art Institute, which is the largest donation to an Institute of Art, uh, again, in, in American history. Now, this is one of the fun facts about the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, many of you might remember this board game called Masterpiece, the classic art auction game. And, and it's, it's a wonderful piece of nostalgia, uh, if for nothing else, just looking at the cover uh, and the individuals. I imagine that Lubbock is represented by the man uh, over on the left side with the cowboy hat. But what the Masterpiece uh, the classic art auction game was, was just as you imagine, you were kind of a wealthy person and you bid on auction pieces of art. But what was unique about this game, and I actually remember this game from when I was a kid, was all of the paintings and pieces of art were from the Art Institute of Chicago uh, exclusively. So if you actually played this game, you probably have an understanding of the pieces of art uh, in the Art Institute already, believe it or not. So moving forward, uh, as I mentioned, they have several different d uh, areas of art, African art uh, and Indian art, American art, ancient and Byzantine, Asian art, European decorative art, European painting and sculpture, modern and contemporary art photography, prints and drawings and textiles. Uh, I wanna show just a few pieces outside of the Western tradition, kind of showing just that they have this collection there. Uh, none of their outside of the Western art collections are very large, uh, but they are enough pieces to kind of give the artist an idea of what is outside of the Western tradition. Uh, this is of course a classic Greek amphora, uh, and you've got to always appreciate just by looking at it, you can always tell who the boys and the girls are uh, the women are the ones with the white skin and the men are, of course, the ones with the darker skin. Uh, I also love their not quite straight line on the top of this piece. Uh, this was before, I guess, that was a, a, an essential thing for design. They actually have a few pieces from the Middle Ages as well. Uh, including pieces from uh, an illuminated manuscript, uh, the Book of Hours, one of the many Book of Hours that are out there. And we also have this painting, Bur Burnett Maratel. Uh, and if nothing else, if you just look at this, uh, Bur Burnett Maratel is from Spain. Uh, the illuminated Book of Hours is from Northern Europe. Uh, look at the amount of variation that actually exists within medieval art. And, and I think that people think of the art of the Renaissance and, and the period before it as being a very 
uh, uh, closed in terms of what you're actually going to see, but there's a tremendous amount of variety that's actually available. Uh, if you look at the Book of Hours and the amount of ornamentation that actually is in the Book of Hours, that's as much of what you're looking at as the, uh, 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 the image. And then when we look at the painting, this is of course Saint George and the Dragon, uh, a wonderful version of a dragon there, but uh, a very fully conceived painting. If you look in the background at this very, very wonky kind of castle, you'll notice this is of course before linear perspective uh, concept <coughs> and you oftentimes have buildings that look kind of askew for that reason. Outside of the Western tradition, uh, this is a piece from Africa and the artist is actually all the way of ice. Uh, and this is a, a veranda post. This is one of four posts that actually held up a giant veranda. So this is a functional piece of art that has then been sculpted down uh, to, to essentially have a statue as a functional part of the veranda. And again, absolutely beautiful, uh, fun, abstract figures. And this is a, a more famous print, The Great Wave, uh, off of Japan. Uh, this is Kanagawa, a very famous series of woodblock prints by Hoko Saya. Uh, and again, this is a pretty famous print. Uh, the Chicago Art Institute actually has this. Uh, if nothing else, you can look at this and you can see Mount Fuji there peeking up in the background. Uh, and you've got this tremendous wave almost of, of titanic proportions uh, in comparison to Mount Fuji. And then you've got these wonderful boats with uh, fishermen, of course, in them balancing through the waves. Also from that area of the world, we have a Shaka Muni Buddha seated in meditation. Uh, and again, this type of, of, of Buddhist image uh, is, is always in my opinion, kind of a wonderful thing to see uh, in the collection of a museum. But you'll also notice that this is made out of granite, uh, which I think is a very unique kind of instrument of art. But again, uh, uh, having pieces from India uh, from the 12th century. And this is actually one of my favorite pieces that they have uh, outside of the Western tradition, even though this is kind of still in the Western tradition. This is an Aztec ceremonial stone. Uh, it's commemorating essentially a king coming to power. Uh, and the fascinating thing about this is it's actually carved on the majority of the sides. What you're looking at on the left side is thought to be uh, essentially the front of the stone. Uh, but then when you look at the back, they have got this absolutely wonderful, uh, it looks like a bunny uh, with very, very large bucked teeth. But if you look very closely on the side of the stone, there is additional carving as well within this. Uh, this was taken from the city of Tenoch Tichlan, uh, what would be thought of as contemporary Mexico City. And now we move into the Western tradition. Uh, and we start with El Greco and, and uh, it's interesting because we've looked at a few different museums and it's kind of interesting to see where they start uh, in terms of their, their main collection. And in this case, we start right before, uh, uh, well, we start with El Greco again uh, in around 1570 or so with two of his pieces. We have another one of these wonderful systems where if you look at the date, uh, you can find the date in the accession number. So the Assumption of the Virgin, which is a pretty well and uh, recognized piece by El Greco, was really one of the earliest pieces uh, that they have in their collection. This was actually put into the museum's collection as early as 1906. Uh, so this shows, again, where the formation of their art identity came from. It came from, again, the Renaissance, things like El Greco. Well, I can hear, I was wondering if you could. Wow, I'm having a, a, a wonderful uh, background sounds there. So again, if everyone can mute their microphones, uh, you, again, if you're a, a museum worth, your, worth your, your gumption, you have to have at least one good Rembrandt. And this is another example uh, of Rembrandt's just mastery of the human figure. Uh, again, it kind of really transcends time to me how well he can paint people. And this is kind of one of the conversations that we have is how realistic do people actually look 
when they're painted. Uh, I always think with Rembrandt, he probably achieves it better than most. And it, it's even more remarkable to think that Rembrandt was painting during a period when there was no photography. So when you look at these kind of like stances like this gentleman has, this looks like a very photographic kind of stance, even though the photograph hasn't, of course, been uh, invented. You'll notice that his hand is kind of tucked into his cloak. Uh, again, kind of a, a, a formal style, but the turning of the body and the way the gold chain is hanging off of his robe, uh, absolutely beautiful. Again, Rembrandt is, is always a master painter uh, of portraiture. We then move to Watteau. Uh, and again, we've already moved forward to about 1718. And you can see how quickly uh, we kind of get to the modern era in art uh, within the Chicago collection. Uh, this is uh, the, these kind of uh, strange paintings that were made uh, uh, during this period, during the Rococo period of uh, essentially middle-class people enjoying the lifestyle of Greek, Greek goddesses and, and, and uh, that type of thing. Again, you've got this pastoral setting with all of these people uh, kind of enjoying themselves. But if you look over in the corner, you can see uh, a satyr type figure kind of sitting, uh, uh, looking onto the, the rest of the group. And Delacroix uh, is really the person that we look at as the beginning of the style of art that will eventually lead into Impressionism. And this is a wonderful example of that idea. Uh, the thing that you really look with Eugene Delacroix's paintings is the fluidity of how he paints and also the very, very bright use of colors uh, within his paintings. And again, these are, these are marks that, that will eventually lead into Impressionism or the idea of Impressionism. And within this painting, you get that full range of colors beautiful, beautiful tones. Uh, and again, this kind of fluidity that he's showing in this combat between two horses. And turning to the American side of things, this is of course, Thomas Cole. Uh, we looked at a Thomas Cole painting when we looked at the Whitney, but this is a, a, a closer example to what we would think of as a traditional Thomas Cole type of painting. And, and again, most of these paintings were done in the northern area of New York. This is, of course, Niagara Falls. Uh, and it's very much in keeping with this European tradition of landscapes. Uh, I personally really love this painting for several reasons. Uh, one, we have the falls and he kind of takes the landscape and just kind of blends it evenly into the sky. So there isn't even that much of a separation between what we think of as the sky and the clouds and what we would think of as the tree line. Uh, another fascinating thing, and this is again, keeping with the tradition of European paintings of landscape during this period, uh, is you've got this big, beautiful, lush landscape. Uh, and if you just take a few minutes and you look, you can usually find one or two individuals kind of tucked in the landscape itself. Uh, I imagine some of you have already found there looks like there's a Native American pair uh, on this cliff edge actually looking over the lake itself. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but if you look in the background, you've got these two little white dots here too. Those could very conceivably be people as well, kind of way off in the distance, showing this sense of, of, of space uh, within the two of them. And now we, of course, move to French Impressionism or, or pre-Impressionism, if you will. Uh, and I think that this is an interesting collection of Manet paintings, because if you're familiar uh, with Manet's work, uh, these are the most non-Manet paintings you'll see uh, in a while. Manet is, of course, very famous for painting people in kind of a contemporary setting uh, within the space of, of Paris. Uh, if you look at these two paintings, we again have a religious painting. And to my knowledge, uh, Manet painted very, very few religious paintings. I think this is one of the only ones that really pops to my mind. But even within this, uh, if you look at the gentleman on the far left corner, he's dressed more closer to what I would say would be the contemporary clothing of France at the time, and less as a historical person within a painting of Jesus. And again, uh, I don't know of a lot of seascapes painted by Manet. Uh, the Chicago Art Institute, of course, has this one. 
And we move into really French Impressionism. And, and again, if you look at a lot of the accession dates, uh, this is the main body of work that was actually kind of taken in uh, uh, during the, the 1920s to form this massive collection of 52 Impressionist paintings. Uh, Bert Morisot recently had an exhibition in Texas, so I think a lot of you know her work. Uh, Bert Morisot, I really enjoy her work because I think of all the Impressionists, she went the farthest out in terms of just pure painterly style. Uh, this woman almost disappears into the paint strokes that are the background wall. Uh, and, and again, if you look at this and you look at how openly she's painting things, these very, very large brush strokes to give us the sensation of plain and area, uh, and again, has it kind of melts its way into the background. And she's done this kind of off-white throughout and all of these little bits of color then kind of pop out of the work uh, by way of that. When you look at this, look at how much her one earring is just illuminated within the space of this painting. Uh, and then we look at the walls and we see these kind of flower uh, uh, floral marks of color kind of sticking out from the wall that then get balanced out or re-shown uh, within uh, the dress itself. Here in the corner, we have a little tiny blue bow. Uh, and again, down here, we have a little piece of red. And then just a little bit of an accent there on the mirror itself. Uh, it's as if Berth Marceau was saying, how much of an abstract painting can I paint and have a figure in it, but just at the edge of being unrecognizable. And I think again, for the period of art that she's painting in, uh, it's absolutely amazing that someone would paint in this fashion. And, and again, I love Morisot's work, uh, always just kind of these lush, beautiful uh, renditions uh, uh, of Impressionist painting. And then we have Gustav Kaibot. And, and the thing that uh, about the Chicago Institute is they don't have as large of a collection as some of the other areas of the world, but they have a lot of really important paintings in the grander conversation of art. And, and I think that as we go through this lecture, many of you will be like, oh, wow, they have that piece. And oh, wow, they have that piece. And you kind of get that a lot uh, from the Chicago Institute. Uh, this is, uh, in my mind, the most famous of the Kaibot paintings. It shows the split perspective, uh, this wonderful realistic Paris scene where again showing the contemporary people and I think I've mentioned this before uh, with this painting this is like when umbrellas were kind of first working their way into Paris society so it's kind of this display of a modern invention too. Uh, you've got our couple walking towards us but you'll notice this man walking next to them and he's actually tilting his umbrella to the side uh, so that he can kind of walk around them if you will. Uh, this is also just a wonderful painting in terms of composition. Uh, if you look at the line of the street pole and then the line of the umbrella, it makes this wonderful parallel. Uh, and then you of course have the focus of the painting in between those two lines. They have an incredibly large collection uh, of Monet's paintings at uh, the, the Institute. And if you've been there, and I, I wish I could have uh, set up an example of this, because this is something that I learned when I was at the Institute that really illuminated Monet for me. And that was that they had a series of his haystack paintings, five of them, all on the same wall. Uh, and from that, you really get this appreciation of what Monet is trying to do. Uh, this is one of his earlier paintings that he did when he was first trying to paint atmospheric effects. And he would go to the train station and paint not only the trains, but also the, 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 the smoke that was coming off of them and the fog of the day uh, and all of these atmospheric ideas within the context of the painting. Uh, and when you look at this, it's not just like gray smoke. You'll notice he has these really wonderful blue tones that he's accented in the smoke itself. Again, Ma uh, Monet is really the person who illuminates for us what the colors and, and what things really look like uh, rather than what we kind of perceive them as being, uh, if that makes any sense. And here we have, again, a, a wonderful example 
of one of his wheat stacks or haystacks. And, and as I mentioned, uh, these are really dynamic when you put them in, in uh, connection with one another. Uh, uh, and you can do that within the Art Institute. But again, uh, and you look at this, you look and you see these wonderful hits of color. And again, this very, very open type of paintbrush leading us back to the Delacroix painting that I was talking about earlier. Uh, he puts in these wonderful little slashes of, of red tone. You'll notice some here and, of, and here as well with the sun actually hitting that side of the wheat stack. Uh, and again, just as a reminder, the point of this uh, and these paintings are not just the aesthetic beauty, but to point out that things look different depending on the time of year uh, and also the time of day that we are looking at them and that there are these wonderful hidden colors uh, that Monet was able to exercise from his works uh, in order to show the common person the wealth of colors that are in nature. And of course, a water lily as well. Uh, but what you'll notice about the water lily series uh, is that they're very late in terms of his career. Uh, most of these are painted around 1906 and later on than that. Uh, and again, when you look at the history of art, uh, there's already cubism and proto-cubism at this time. So he continues to work on these larger and larger scale paintings and, and they're absolutely beautiful, but Art has also kind of moved down the road uh, as well. And one of my favorite Renoirs, uh, uh, it's just so incredibly lush. Uh, I recently saw a quote about Renoir that he just likes to paint all of the beautiful things you would see in the world. And I think that this is a wonderful example. Uh, this is about as impressionistic as you can get in terms of a painting. Again, these very, very large open brush strokes, uh, this wonderful uh, sensation of color uh, that you get from the paintings and this fluidity of things kind of blending together between nature uh, uh, and the rest of the scene. A few of the highlights you might not have noticed, uh, this man is actually smoking a cigarette. Uh, I think it's kind of funny that Renoir took the time uh, to paint that in. We of course have this young girl here too, uh, but if you look very, very closely on this path, there's actually a couple there as well. Uh, and then when you go all the way around the path, you've got these two little dots in the background there, uh, which are again, another set of people. So within this painting, you've got the foreground people, you've got the middle ground people, and then you've got the background people. And with each set, he kind of removes more and more detail in favor of just uh, these little painterly strokes that he's going to make. Uh, again, uh, this is one of these paintings I could, I could spend a significant amount of time just looking at uh, because of the beautiful colors he's able to just exercise from the canvas. Uh, if you look at the very top, look at these wonderful purples and lavenders uh, that he's tucked into the very top of this tree. Uh, again, absolutely beautiful painting. And another one of his very famous paintings is of course, Two Sisters on the Terrace, uh, again, brought into the collection in 33. Another example of kind of this lush beautifulness that the Impressionists were so incredibly famous for. Uh, and again, if, if you look at our couple here in the foreground and this beautiful uh, basket of flowers in the woman's lap, there in the background, you of course, again, have two other figures in this boat uh, far off in the distance. But if you look at the vegetation, it's very hard to get the sensation of distance between uh, what's happening on the balcony or on the terrace and then the space behind it uh, uh, as it all kind of blends together as we lead off into the lake. And George Seurat's A Sunday Afternoon on the Isle of Grand Jatte uh, is, of course, in the Chicago Institute of Art. Uh, if you've ever seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, the famous movie, they have a scene with this and another one of the pieces uh, that we'll see later. But uh, this is just an incredibly famous piece of art. This is this massive, massive painting that was done uh, in the uh, pointillist style, which is similar to Impressionism, but again, what you're looking at is, is just thousands and thousands, if not close to a million, I would imagine, tiny little dots that actually blend together from our visual perception uh, and create a solid form. 
Uh, the wonderful thing about this version, this slide of the painting, is if you look very, very closely, and, and a lot of people don't know this, in addition to the painting itself, uh, Seurat went through and he actually painted a border around the painting that you can see here uh, that's a lot more like of a dark purple character uh, to kind of balance out all of the greens that are actually within the painting itself. So in this sense, he painted kind of a frame around his own frame and his own painting in this pointillist style, uh, again, contributing back to the main composition, even though we might not readily understand or get why. Uh, again, if you look at little areas like here where this orange transforms into blue, uh, you kind of see what I'm talking about. He does it then again here on the back or on the very, very bottom of the painting. This is Jules Breton's Son of a Lark from 1884. And this is, uh, I, again, a, a peasant painting and it's kind of tucked in the middle of all of this impressionism and post-impressionism that we're looking at. And if nothing else, uh, this beautiful painting, you, you have to really appreciate uh, that sun in the background, either rising or setting there uh, uh, in the distance. And how, if you look at this sickle or, or scythe that she has in her hand, the shape of it is really accenting uh, the sun there in the background. So you have this parallel between the two forms. But this is, again, a reminder that people were painting realistically, even when the Impressionists were painting. Uh, this wasn't something that, again, like every artist in the whole world got a memo one day and decided to start painting in the Impressionist style. Uh, the majority of people who were painting in Europe were painting things that looked more like this uh, than what we would think of as the Impressionist. And then we go to Cezanne, uh, and Cezanne is, of course, this quintessential figure that takes us, in most people's mind, from the Impressionist period to the post-Impressionist. And again, his ability to look at compositions and really find the basic forms and shapes within them. And this is an excellent example of that. Uh, if you look at the buildings in the foreground and how very cubist they actually look, uh, and he's making this wonderful comparison between the rectilinear forms here in the foreground, and then as we move off across the water and then across the bay to these mountains, these more organic forms there in the distance. And Degas, a very later piece from 1885, The Millinery Shop, uh, again, this wonderful use of color uh, from one of the Impressionists. And as I mentioned, if you're really a fan of the Impressionists, I, I do recommend making a trip to Chicago. And here we have Van Gogh's portrait. Uh, and and I, I know I must say this every time we look at a Van Gogh painting, but this is actually one of my favorite of his paintings and of his self-portrait. Uh, if you remember the complementary colors we were talking about when we were looking at the Seurat painting that he was doing around the outside, there's a very similar thing with this. And, and what a complementary color is, is if you think of your color wheel, they're the colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. And what happens is when you put them next to each other, since they are opposite each other, they kind of have this way of, of really being uh, vol very vivacious, if you will. And, and a great example of that is orange and green are, are, are essentially opposite each other or reddish orange and green. And if you look at these little flecks of orange on this green background and how much they really just kind of fly off the background, that's an excellent example of this. Uh, I also really love this painting for, for a couple more reasons. One, uh, if you, re you can really kind of take it apart in your mind. When you really look at his head, you start to really see all of these individual brush strokes that he's actually doing. If you look at the side of his hair, this is a wonderful example of where this color tone kind of transfers into this darker tone that he then has behind his ear. Uh, I, I also love that his posturing uh, and his facial expression, and it almost looks like he has his mouth just kind of slightly open. And if you think about painting a self-portrait, most people, again, would have this kind of rigid sense of how they want to portray themselves. And here, it's not so much the case where, again, he's really giving us the sensation of motion uh, and inner turmoil 
by way of the painting itself. Uh, again, look at the beautiful use of color and tone uh, uh, within his coat. And I love this little like blue bow tie or tie that he has on, uh, just this little splash of like sky blue in this sea of, of green and, and uh, uh, darker reds. Uh, he just puts this little tab of blue, uh, uh, just, just this wonderful little flare, if you will. Moving forward, his bedroom in Arles. And, and again, this is one of the more famous uh, Van Gogh paintings. And, and the thing that I actually really love about this, because I, I am very happy to see this, that I finally found a copy of this painting that has the true sense of color uh, that is actually in this painting. And, and I think that this is something that's lost, is when you really look at the walls of this painting, it really should have this kind of sky blue sense to it. And oftentimes it gets kind of transformed into this gray tone uh, uh, by way of a bad slide. But when you really look at this, you notice all of the green that's on the floorboards uh, and then this green that he has in the shutter set too. And uh, his own paintings hanging on the wall, kind of hanging over his bed. And then these wonderful chairs uh, positioned in the space too. Uh, again, this, th these are incredibly famous paintings by Van Gogh, uh, and it almost boggles the mind that they're in Chicago of all places, but as I mentioned, uh, there's an incredibly rich collection there. And again, moving back to Cezanne and his basket of apples, and if you, if you remember from the beginning of my lecture and that board game called Masterpieces, this painting is actually featured as the painting that everyone uh, is of course bidding on uh, uh, within the, the, the game. But another amazing example of Cezanne and, and his use of twisting the, the, the painting to kind of match what he wants of a composition rather than the sensation of what you would actually see. Uh, and a lot of what Cezanne does with these kind of still lifes is just that. It's his idea that I should be able to move things around within my canvas to make them more interesting. Uh, a basic example is if you look at the back of this table and you follow the line, it starts here, then we go behind these biscuits and we move down just a little bit. And then we go behind this wine bottle and this basket of apples. And all of a sudden we're way down here. Uh, you'll also notice that the basket of apples is kind of tilted up in this very impossible type of way where it would obviously have something suspended uh, behind it in order to push it up at that angle. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the table, it's the same thing. You can follow this line and it just kind of ends up up here for some reason where again, the composition has been changed to what Cezanne thinks is appropriate. Uh, again, uh, another very famous piece by Toulouse-Lautrec uh, at the Moulin Rouge, uh, one of the very famous paintings of, of kind of people relaxing after the nightlife uh, that you would experience there. This is actually a very famous version uh, of the Moulin Rouge because if you look at this figure standing here, uh, this is thought to actually be Toulouse-Lautrec. Uh, and again, he was a, a dwarf, so his size, he's probably standing in comparison to the person that he's standing next to. And then we move to Mary Cassatt. And again, this painting was in the collection as early as 1910. And when you think about that, it was painted in 1891. Again, this is only 20 years after this painting was painted, it ends up uh, in the Chicago Institute. Uh, this is my favorite Mary Cassatt painting uh, because, I mean, there's multiple reasons, but this is a, a, just this wonderful example uh, of what Mary Cassatt could paint that a lot of the other Impressionists just did not get close to in terms of this very intimate relationship uh, between a mother and their daughter, uh, as we're assuming as, as essentially her feet are being washed. So you've got this absolutely beautiful, wonderful scene uh, that's very emotional and, and, and very hard not to just enjoy. But the more you look at the painting, the more dynamic and beautiful it becomes, in my opinion. Uh, I think that when you think of Impressionism, going back to, again, like Bert Morisot and what she was doing, I think Mary Cassatt does a lot of the same thing. Uh, I have in this highlight so that we can see specifically what I'm talking about. When you look at these two faces, they're very realistic. 
Uh, you can tell who they are and it almost looks like it's from a realistic painting. But then you look at the background and you look at how sparsely the background is actually painted and how like loosely it's painted in this impressionistic style. Uh, when you look at the full painting, you'll notice that she kind of does the same thing underneath the bowl on this carpet itself. So we've got our area of focus, the, the mother and the daughter together. And that's again, in this realistic fashion, even to the point where we can see the light on their hair reflecting. And then as we move away from the central part of the composition, things become less and less detailed, less direct and, and more sparse. And if you really think about how your eyes look at things, it's very similar to that. When you look at something in a specific detail, you're focusing on one thing and everything in the background kind of becomes like this impressionist painting. So in this, not only is she creating this beautiful work with multiple ways of painting, she is in some way kind of mirroring how we look at things within the world itself. And we move again to America with Winslow Homer. Uh, this is a beautiful watercolor painting that he did. And, and uh, all of these white sections are probably just the paper kind of coming through. But this is called After the Hurricane, uh, where you actually have this individual on the beach uh, with the broken boat around him. And Winslow Homer actually did a painting uh, that's almost like a predecessor with this, uh, with this poor gentleman on the boat with a broken mast kind of in the middle of the water. So it's good to see that things turned out so well uh, for this gentleman. Pablo Picasso's old guitarist from 1903. Uh, is in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, uh, to me, this is one of the more famous uh, paintings by Picasso, if not one of his most famous. And continuing, uh, again, woman with a helmet of hair. This is done during his blue period, very close to the painting we saw before. Uh, again, with these very elonged figures, uh, very reminiscent of what we would see from El Greco, uh, uh, another one of his countrymen uh, several hundred years earlier. And they have a Redon painting. And, and I actually saw a Redon exhibition when I was there uh, at the Art Institute. And I think that a lot of people don't know Odilian Redon, but he's kind of this pre-surrealist painter that's painting in this like symbolic dreamlike style where he'll oftentimes have realistic features like this woman's face, but the rest of it really kind of looks like this dreamlike phase. And, and if you think about the history of art, we're pretty far off from surrealism, but we do have this kind of early symbolic period of art that leads directly into the later paintings by people like Salvador Dali. Uh, we have another Degas from 1905. Uh, what you'll notice with this is this is actually done with pastels. Uh, so this is a move away from the traditional medium of painting. Uh, and again, Degas was one of the early practitioners of pastels uh, in a really profound way. And this is a great example of how he's using that medium uh, to maximum success. But again, it looks a lot like the Morisot painting where you see this figure in the center and we can see that figure, but the farther we kind of move away, the less things become direct and distinct and it becomes more uh, of just this abstraction. And now we're gonna get a little, little wacky here with Picasso uh, in Cubism. And, and they do have a very large collection of Cubist work as well. Uh, as I kind of showed at the beginning, there is a very large public statue done by Picasso actually in Chicago. Uh, this is one of his early Cubist paintings, Head of a Woman. Uh, this is when we could still kind of understand uh, the majority of the composition. But then we move to things like this one. Uh, this is Den Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, and Kahnweiler was uh, the art dealer of Picasso. And we've moved even farther into this Cubist identity where, again, we're just looking at the planes of art uh, and putting them together, not necessarily in a direct linear fashion, but like Cezanne, kind of moving the table around to what we want. Uh, if you're looking at this and you, you can't really see anything distinguishable, uh, Conweiler's face is right in here. 
Uh, you can see his nose and his two eyes. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom, you can actually see his two hands kind of together. Uh, the rest of it, this is probably a table with maybe a bottle on it. Uh, and then from there, you can use your imagination and, and fill in the blanks for whatever you'd like the rest of the composition to be. Uh, this is a little bit easier to access. This is a Juan Gris painting of Picasso. Uh, but again, it's a little bit easier to kind of understand what they're doing with the cubist forms within this work. And we go to Matisse. Uh, and of course, if you have Picasso, you must have Matisse. Uh, and this is, a, again, another very famous painting. This is Bathers by a River, uh, done in 1909 to 1910, and then again reworked in 1916 to 17. This is a pretty big canvas, and this is this very important painting in Matisse's career, uh, because this is, uh, as, as they've often said, this is Matisse trying to paint like Picasso. Uh, if you know Matisse's extensive uh, paintings in his history, this is kind of unique because you've got very, very muted colors. Uh, and again, it's kind of cubist. It looks much more like what you would see from Picasso's camp than that from Matisse. But as I mentioned, this was his efforts to kind of absorb the cubist identity within his work and learn the lessons of cubism uh, in, in the process. And here we have Kandinsky as early as 1912, painting in this purely abstract manner, uh, landscape with two poplars. Uh, the poplars are here. I think one is green and one is red. Uh, and here you can see a, a house as well, but we're moving closer and closer to pure abstract art. Uh, and again, it's important to recognize that it happens as early as 1912, uh, that people are really starting to move directly away from what we think of as realistic representation. Jean Metz from 1913, Woman with a Fan. Uh, and this also shows that when we went to cubism, uh, pure cubism, a lot of artists didn't really stay there. And what you'll notice is we're kind of returning back to realism. And, and that's kind of this overall trend that you're going to see throughout the rest of this lecture and also before. Uh, and kind of my opinion of art in general is that you really have this kind of movement from realism, things like this, uh, towards this pure abstraction. But once we reach that pure abstraction, we kind of turn around and we move back towards realism. Uh, and a lot of modern art is kind of just this balance between those two poles and the movement in between them. Uh, again, if you kind of look at the work as we go forward, you'll see this movement, this circular movement from pure abstraction back to realism, back to pure abstraction, if you will. Back to pure abstraction. Uh, this is Malevich, and this is a, a, a very bizarre painting because it was painted as early as 1915. Malevich, uh, along with Kandinsky, are some of the first artists to just paint in a purely 100% non-objective uh, manner like this, where they're just using basic shapes uh, in order to make their construction. Uh, I think this is kind of like a peculiar painting, though, because you look at the painting in itself, and you just kind of say, it's mostly just a bunch of rectangles and there's one green kind of circle there at the bottom, but then you read the title of it, Painterly Realism of a Football Player. Uh, and all of a sudden my brain just kind of goes, football player, well, that's rather peculiar. Uh, and what I came up with with this is again, color masses in the fourth dimension. Fourth dimension is actually time. So there's this aspect of time to it. Uh, and what I came up with with this was that you might be actually looking at this looking down at the composition rather than looking straight across to it. Uh, almost imagine that you're like in a helicopter and you're, you're looking down over a football field. Uh, and what you're seeing is the different parts of the football field from above you looking down, or excuse me, looking down rather than looking straight across. Uh, it helped to make a little bit more sense. I viewed kind of these as, as a player moving, uh, the green ball being the soccer ball, and maybe this was like, the net of the goalie or something along those lines. Uh, and again, we move from pure abstraction, but we slowly are making our way back towards realism. And we have the first of 
quite a few Georgia O'Keeffe paintings that are in the collection of uh, the Chicago Institute of Art. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe had a very intimate relationship with New York, but she also had a very close relationship uh, with the Art Institute of Chicago. She actually went to school there uh, and, and she actually worked very closely with them. Uh, so a lot of the O'Keeffe paintings uh, are actually in Chicago rather than New York City. This is a great example of that. Um, we also have, again, sculpture is, is something we, we can't forget about. But as early as 1920, they were creating pure abstract sculpture uh, like the golden bird uh, from Brancusi, uh, as you can see here. Uh, when you really look at this, you're supposed to look at this beautiful golden form uh, and the organicness of it and compare it to what's occurring with the base uh, and, and this pedestal that it's actually on, that these are rectilinear forms in comparison to the organic form above them. And we have Mo Digliani uh, as well. And, and I, I have a wonderful comparison set up for us here where we have Mo Digliani from 1916 doing this wonderful pair. And again, kind of cubism, but kind of realism. And as I mentioned, moving back towards realism with Mo Digliani uh, and the people that he's painting, but he still paints in this very, very unique style. Uh, we put this in comparison to American Gothic and a different uh, couple. Uh, and again, American Gothic uh, was bought by the Chicago Institute in 1930. Uh, they were wise enough to see how important this painting was very, very early on and purchased it. And, and, and by doing that, uh, by having American Gothic purchased as early as it was and in the Chicago Art Institute, it instantly becomes this you know, institutionalized wonderful piece of American art that we all know so well. And it shows you the importance of museums because here's kind of just this philosophical question. What if the Chicago Art Institute had not bought this painting? What if this painting had bought, been bought by a private collector or even worse had never been bought by anyone and had just kind of been relegated out to history? It would not have the presence in all of our existence and the importance in American art that it really truly does. And, and again, a, a, the, the museum is the reason, the catalyst for that actually occurring uh, in this sense. I mentioned Georgia O'Keeffe. This is a, a wonderful photograph that I found of her uh, and some of the donations that she did give to the Chicago Institute. Here we have Cow Skull with Calico Roses, uh, a wonderful painting. Uh, I always think of this as an exercise in the different variations of white that are actually possible on a canvas. Uh, you can see it there. And here we go to Diego Rivera, uh, in his painting of weaving from 1936. Uh, I have lectured uh, quite a bit on Diego Rivera and I, and I always am quick to point out the importance uh, of the Mexican muralist when it comes to American art. Uh, and this is right at the period uh, when this would be occurring. Again, uh, this is a weaving painting showing the traditional weaving style uh, uh, there that would be within Mexico and it's found its way into America. But even though this was painted in 36, you'll notice it didn't make its way into the collection until 1998. And then we move to Salvador Dali uh, and a very young portrait of him and another uh, photograph of him at the Chicago Institute. Uh, I have two different pieces to share. Uh, the Venus uh, de Milo with drawers is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, I, I really love his remake sculptures that he does. Uh, not just that the, the Venus de Milo has been giving these drawers as like a cupboard, but these big fuzzy pom-pom balls that he's put on there uh, as essentially the way of opening these drawers. The next painting I have is called The Inventions of Monsters, uh, again by Salvador Dali. I have a nice big image of it, so I wanted to uh, use the whole screen. Uh, and again, this is this kind of dreamlike state uh, that you see so very often from Salvador Dali's paintings. Uh, this does not give us this 
at ease kind of feeling though. This is kind of a problematic painting. And again, going back here, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, to the inventions of monsters, uh, when you look at this, you have to remember the time period that we're talking about too. Uh, that this is right very prior to uh, World War II and that this is also in Spain. Uh, and we of course have the Spanish Civil War leading into uh, World War II. This is the very famous painting, of course, that we have uh, the flaming giraffe there in the background, uh, kind of this sensation of dream and horror mixed together in one uh, sensation. Uh, but just a reminder that it is just a painting and there were no animals <laughs> actually harmed uh, in the creation of this work. And Magritte uh, is a, a, another wonderful surrealist, but he's very simplified in terms of what we would think of as surrealism. Uh, I'm actually putting together a video on Magritte right now if you're interested in Magritte, but he has this very simplistic way of creating art where he takes a very regular scene and then he'll do something very off in a very small part of it and then he gives us a title that kind of adds an extra little aspect to the painting. Uh, this is definitely the case with tri time transfixed, where we have a very barren room. Uh, and within that barren room, we have a fireplace. Uh, and above the fireplace, you have a clock and a mirror. But if you really look at the mirror, you'll notice it's not even reflecting everything in the room. We're missing one of the candlesticks. And it's really not reflecting any other thing within the space of the room as well. There's no other reflection, it's just a blank space. You'll notice there are no candles in the candle holder, but what we do have is this train coming out of uh, uh, the fireplace itself. And we think of the fire and the smoke that's caused of course from a fireplace and that connects us back to the train. And then we can also view the train as uh, uh, the fireplace as being a train tunnel. And then we go and we think about this concept of time in relationship to these two things uh, uh, together. And again, you can spend a good amount of your life thinking about what do trains have to do with time? Am I waiting for someone? Am I on a train and experiencing time that way, which would be different uh, than time standing still? There's a wealth of things you can kind of connect with this work. Uh, we then move to Marc Chagall, and Marc Chagall has a few important pieces in the Art Institute of Chicago. Again, another photograph of the artist at the Art Institute. Uh, this is his white crucifixion where he's taking the idea of the sacrifice of <laughs> Jesus and he's equating it back to the Jewish community. Uh, if you look at the central figure of Christ, uh, again, we have him, but as you kind of look around, you'll notice the very Jewish aspects to a lot of the extra images. Again, like this gentleman uh, moving off with what I can believe to be the Torah there uh, uh, within his arms. And Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, uh, probably again one of the most famous American paintings. Not only does the Art Institute have American Gothic, they also have Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. And uh, again, this is a, a perfect example of Edward Hopper's work uh, around this period. And again, 1942, we're firmly entrenched in World War II. And that kind of explains this sense of absence and, and space uh, within the painting itself. But on the other side, we also have Archibald John Motley uh, showing this kind of other aspect of American culture, this wonderful scene uh, within a bar where you have different people enjoying themselves and this kind of purplish pink tint uh, throughout the entire painting, really giving this overall sensation of joy uh, uh, within the space of the work. This is a painting by Peter Bloom. And to be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about Peter Bloom. Uh, uh, there's always one artist I always kind of have to do a little bit more research on because I enjoy them so much. And Peter Bloom was, was the artist for this lecture. Uh, he's an American surrealist. He was actually an immigrant to this country. Uh, but he was incredibly popular for the time period that he worked. Uh, this painting called The Rock uh, was actually uh, uh, high, was 
was received as the, the highest work within uh, uh, an, a juried exhibition, I believe, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is, again, right after the war. And if you look at the construction that's occurring on the left side, a lot of Americans kind of connected with this idea, uh, especially after the war uh, and the amount of construction that occurred in America. This just looks very much like a surrealist painting that you would see from Dolly or even Magritte, but with one kind of tinge or, or change. Uh, and this is just my opinion, but Peter Bloom grew up looking at comic books and comics in newspapers and things like that. And you can see that kind of affecting his work. And I think that's one of the things that we bring to the table as American artists that a lot of artists from other countries don't have. Uh, this is an incorporation of all of the different media types that, that Peter Bloom would have seen uh, into one painting. And it almost looks like something that you would almost see in like a Mad Magazine uh, comic or something along the those lines. It has that same kind of lushness and illustration aspect to it, making it a very, very American piece of art, uh, in my opinion. And then we get to Jackson Pollock and, and a great rainbow. And this is another one uh, that you kind of have to spend some time looking at. Uh, we have a few of these non-objective paintings in a row and it'll show you how different people have kind of reacted to this idea. Uh, the thing that you'll notice most about grade rainbow is if you look at the bottom of the composition, there's a lot more color down here at the very bottom than there is in the rest of the painting. So this is another one of these examples where you have to spend a while kind of formulating the painting and eventually you start to notice all of these highlights. Uh, Jackson Pollock is one side of the coin of abstract expressionism and the other side uh, is definitely Willem de Kooning. And, and they have very different approaches to the paintings. And what you'll notice between these two is they're kind of very similar. Uh, we can kind of admit to that. They both have this overall white and black linear structure with these little aspects of color back into the work. But one of the things that you'll really notice is that de Kooning always has a very specific title. This is excavation. So you start to think about how does the idea of excavation play into this? And for me, I think of almost like an archeological dig where you've got like these different pieces from ancient cultures kind of sifting through the ground and, and you have to keep digging in order to find what the overall structures are. We have one more in this series uh, and this comes from Joan Mitchell who does kind of her version of this but even closer to what we would think of as a concept of something with the title and this is city landscape. Uh, and it, it's, it's again, this kind of franticness that you would have within the city and then this kind of larger areas of complete openness uh, that you would have like in the sky or that type of thing. What this actually reminds me of, and, and this is kind of, a, a, again, a, another personal story, but if you've ever driven across country uh, and you're driving into Lubbock and it's nighttime and you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's nothing and nothing and nothing. And then it's like you round this corner or you go over this little hill and then off in a distance, you see all of these lights uh, illuminating off in, in, in the background. And that's what this kind of reminds me of is that moment where you look off in the distance and you're like, there's Lubbock. I actually see it uh, from the lights even though it's really surrounded by not that very much. And then we get to Francis Bacon, who again, oh man, you could, you could uh, spend an entire lecture just talking about the psychology of this individual. Uh, very briefly, I'll try to explain that Francis Bacon uh, is really kind of the representation of post-war Europe. Uh, he was a person that grew up and lived through World War II in England uh, and experienced the German bombings and experienced a lot of the darker aspects of humanity uh, uh, through his life living there. So when he creates these works, and again, this is in 54, we're not far off from World War II, uh, he's creating these works that give this sense of horror uh, uh, within the space uh, within the spectrum of the paintings. Uh, Figure with Mead is actually probably Francis Bacon's more famous of paintings. Uh, and you'll notice he created this in 1954 and it was accessed into the museum as early as 1956. So just two years after he finished painting, that shows the importance of this work, uh, even though it is so incredibly dark and, and bizarro. And Richard Hunt kind of, uh, uh, 
similar idea, but not quite as horrific. Uh, Richard Hunt creates figures uh, out of constructions that he finds uh, around him. He, he finds old pipes and that type of thing, and then welds the pieces together uh, to create these type of figurative forms. And then we go all the way to abstraction again uh, with Tanaka Atsuku uh, from 1964. Uh, and this, I, it, it took me a second to kind of figure out what the artist was trying to do with this. And he's kind of playing around with this idea of organic lines. And if you really look at this, what you'll notice is it's not just a bunch of squiggles everywhere. There are a bunch of squiggles everywhere, but he's also painted these almost perfect circles within the space of the composition. Uh, and the circle is really thought to be kind of the perfect organic form. So he's kind of playing around with this idea of these perfect organic forms in connection to these organic lines that are flowing around. He's also just making a kind of a nice colorful composition uh, that's aesthetically pleasing. It can be as easy as that uh, as well. And we get to another one of Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings. This is Sky Above the Clouds, number four. Uh, and if you're a, a keen fan of Georgia O'Keeffe's work, you know that these, this series is one of the last series that she actually painted. Uh, she had eye problems towards the end of her life. So this series uh, of Sky Above the Clouds was one of the last series. And the idea is simple that you're, this is what you would see if you were looking out an airplane window. Uh, those are all clouds. Once you get above that cloud bank and you kind of look, the clouds themselves kind of become their own uh, composition or own uh, terrain. What's interesting about this is if you really look at it kind of like a Jackson Pollock, you kind of look at it very quickly and then you look at it a second time and your eyes adjust to it. And what you'll notice is that there's almost like a curvature that happens here. Uh, if you look at these frontal clouds, they go to about right here, about halfway through the canvas. And then there's almost like a turn in the structuring of how she has them stacked. Uh, if you look below this line, you'll notice that they're almost stacked like a brick wall, like a stone wall. But then when you get in this background here, it's almost like they're laying flat, like you're looking at a wall on its side rather than looking at a wall fully erect, if that makes sense to everyone. And then we get to one of my favorite contemporary painters, uh, Gerhard Richter. And, and again, this is kind of like most people look at this, this work and they say, wow, that's a, that's a pretty decent photograph. And then I say to them, well, that's actually a painting. Uh, and it kind of really changes the trajectory of how people think about these. Gerhard Richter is known uh, for creating these incredibly hyper-realistic paintings. And, and I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier about when you paint someone, what do they really look like? Do they actually look like a real person? And I mentioned this with Rembrandt that Rembrandt really was kind of the person who painted people in realistic posturings even before we had the invention of a photograph. Uh, what Richter does, and, and he's the first to admit this, is he will just project uh, an image onto a canvas and then paint the, the projection that is actually on the canvas itself. Uh, and for those of you that think that is like cheating, uh, there's actually people who agree with you. Uh, but again, if you wanna have this incredibly hyper-realistic painting, a, a, a realism beyond all realism, this is kind of the method that you would use in order to get it. Moving forward, David Hockney. Oh, uh, again, another wonderful painter. Uh, this might look surrealistic to many of you, but if you've ever lived in Southern California, this is exactly what Southern California is like. Uh, it's, it's this kind of banality, but with perfect weather is kind of a good way of putting it. Uh, you've got the two figures. These are uh, the Wisemans who are very famous art collectors. Uh, and they're kind of, it almost seems like there would be a pool right where we would be standing looking at this painting. Uh, one of my favorite things about this is not just the extra sculptures that he, Hockney has included in the work, uh, but this totem that we have in the background uh, that's just so incredibly different than everything else uh, that you have within the painting. Uh, and again, when you look at a lot of his color usage, especially this background blue, it's all just one tone. It's this like perfect 78 degree weather, that type of feeling that again, you really do get from living uh, in Southern California for a while. 
and now Alma Thomas, a pure abstraction again uh, from 1972. This is Starry Night uh, and the astronauts. Again, little blobs of paint uh, to give this indication of sky uh, and the spaces in between the plain blobs we kind of then read as being stars uh, in the beautiful night sky. And I mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture uh, that the, the very recently actually the Chicago Institute received this massive, massive body of pop art. Uh, and this is absolutely one of the pieces that was received uh, during that time. You'll notice this is from 1974. Uh, this is one of, one of the many Andy Warhol paintings that he did of Mao Zedong, uh, the famous leader of China. The thing that you have to do for a moment when you look at this painting, and I don't usually say this in most of the works, you have to look at the size of this thing because it is just so <laughs> incredibly huge. It's 176 and a half by 136 and a half inches. So on the bottom, it's 136 inches. 120 inches is 10 feet. So that's it's over 10 feet just at the base. Uh, and of course, if you know Chinese society, communist society, they have these famous portraits of Mao in and around their society as the, the, the chairman of the Communist Party. So Andy Warhol is really just kind of playing off of that image uh, uh, and, and creating these images of Mao uh, in a similar context. But what I love about what Warhol has done is he's taken this very, very serious, important figure in world history. And, and many people have different attitudes about him, but if you really look at what Warhol's done, he's given him eyeshadow. Uh, and it kind of looks like he's wearing lipstick here. And he certainly looks like he has some blush on as well. So he's taken Mao Zedong and really kind of given him a, a makeover, if you will, uh, uh, with, with, with the Warholisms, uh, with the painting that he did. And another very famous piece by Chagall. And again, if you know the, the Ferris Bueller's Day Off movie, there's another scene in front of this. And, and I've, I've mentioned this before, in my opinion, Mark Chagall's work always looks best to me in the form of stained glass windows. And these are called the American windows. Uh, they were created, as you can see from the dates, in 1977 and, and were installed in the Chicago Institute. Uh, again, reflection of American culture, but you also have traditional little things that you would recognize uh, as Chagall images within the space of the work uh, as well. And outside there's a beautiful sculpture garden. Uh, I had to include at least one piece from it. So this is Alexander Calder's uh, Flying Dragon from 1975. And this is the, the last piece I have. It's a very contemporary piece, but I wanted to include uh, Carrie James Marshall in the conversation because he's a very important artist uh, in the contemporary sense. Uh, this is called Many Mansions. And uh, what Carrie uh, Marshall does is this kind of collage style uh, where again, it's a reflection of modern society. In this case, uh, the, you have the Chicago projects in the background, the lower income housing area. And uh, I don't remember the specific name, but the artist points out that most of the lower income housings are always named garden for some reason, uh, as in the case here. So what you have is you've got the projects there in the background and you've got different uh, black or African American individuals working the landscape, but you'll also notice all of these other kind of fun things like this sign here. Uh, then you've got these birds holding uh, this blue ribbon. There's also these Easter baskets there in the foreground and you'll notice uh, and there's this red scroll on the back uh, that's reminiscent of a Bible quote. It says, in my mother's house, uh, something to the, I can't see because I've got my bar across this, uh, mansions, and a, a, again, a reference to, in my father's house, uh, I don't remember the quote, of course, uh, leading to mansions. So thank you all very much. Uh, we, we, uh, I think I ran a little bit long again. Oh, yes, I always do. Uh, next week is our last lecture, uh, which kind of makes me sad. I really enjoyed doing these. Uh, and I hope that you all have too. I know this hasn't been 
the most ideal situation, but I think that we've made something beautiful out of a non-ideal situation. Uh, what I wanna lecture on next week is one of my personal favorite museums, which is the Nelson Atkins uh, in Kansas City. And uh, very much mm -hmm. like the, uh, the Institute in Chicago, it has just a little bit of everything, but the reason that I love it is because nobody would think there would be this amazing art museum uh, in the middle of Kansas City, but in fact, the people who run the museum have done a fabulous job making it a relevant museum. So I hope you all join me next week for, for that lecture. And, and uh, again, we do have next week as well, but do look forward to whatever we're gonna be doing uh, next semester as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Christian. <laughs> and we'll see everyone next yeah. week. Yeah, bye morning. Everybody. Be safe, everyone. Yes, be safe. We will. Next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, Tupperville, who has been elected to the Senate out of Alabama,